We're going to talk, of course, about work zone safety. We're going to start out with talking about why we want to talk about safety, and that's to send everybody home. But we have some unfortunate incidents to talk about. We're going to talk about a little bit about compliance rules and regulations, but we're going to go into something we call beyond compliance practices, best practices. Is it really save lives and send people home every day. We're going to talk a little bit about risk because that's what it's about, is being able to identify and assess the risk. And then last but not least, we're going to close out with some, some more best practices regarding technology and where we're going with technology in the area of, of work zone safety. Now, I'm not going to go through a bunch of statistics. I hope that brings a smile to everybody's face. But uh, they are staggering. Over 100 people every year are killed in work zones, and uh, 20, over 20,000 are, are injured. So that alone gives us reason to take notice and to look at doing things differently and better, always looking for innovative ways to be safer out there. I'm not going to read through a bunch of these incidents, but I will describe some of them. And uh, you yourself probably have stories, of course, much like these, but just uh, two years ago or uh, in the summer of 2015, we had a broom operator doing, preparing a road for chip seal operation. Had the road, that lane closed off. But of course, as things have it, people come into our work zones, right? They come into our area of work. And uh, a lady struck the rear of that broom going about 65 miles an hour, immediately uh, killing our broom operator, leaving behind a young wife and a, and a six-month-old baby. And we've got a lot of stories like that. Subcontractors on our job, milling subcontractor, ground man was hit last, just last year. The uh, vehicle that intruded into the work zone drug that person about 100, 150 feet before they even stopped. They didn't even know he hit him, killed him instantly. Aero boards, you know, I tell you what, these truck mounted attenuators and aero boards really help protect us out there. And I, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But, um, you know, our driver of the air board last year got hit and was put in critical condition. This is a, actually a successful one here. It doesn't look like it, I know. But uh, we had a flagger uh, alarm, uh, warn our crew prior to an incident. Car comes by the flagger, enters into the work zone. This particular flagger had an air horn that we use a lot for advance warning. He hit that air horn, and the crew stopped, dropped what they were doing, took cover, and avoided uh, injury. And it didn't avoid injury to the third party, as you can see, but it avoided injury to our employees. So we're going to talk a lot about that. And even here in Virginia, I think last year you guys had two fatalities with, with backovers in the, uh, in the work zone. So, you know, you've got protection that we need to talk about from third parties from outside the work zone coming in, and then we got to talk about protection within that work zone from our own equipment and our uh, own employees within that. So if we want to start with compliance, we all know what the manual on uniform traffic control devices is. I'm not going to go through that. It's pretty laborious. But uh, that's where it all starts. That's really our Bible of where we start with work zone safety is with the manual on uniform traffic control devices. You guys know there's a lot of typical setups in there. doesn't apply to every situation, though. But that's the starting point with those typical setups in there. It tells us how to space the barrels and drums and traffic control devices and signs based on speed and, and all that. We, we should know all that. That's the compliance and the rules and regulations about setting up uh, external traffic control. That's only part of it because... As I was speaking earlier, there's an internal piece to this. What about protection on our side of the barrel or our side of the drum? And just a few years ago, OSHA came out with a regulation regarding internal traffic control. So the manual on uniform traffic control devices talks about external traffic control, really geared to getting the public through the work zone uh, safely. But then the internal traffic control plan is to address things on our side of the barrels, our side of the drums, dealing with equipment, pedestrian vehicle segregation, things like that. And that's just become a regulation in the past two or three years from OSHA. So you can see some of the points that it does here. It reduces the need to back up. If you can reduce backing up, because 
that's probably the biggest risk hazard there is on our side of the barrel and drums is trucks and equipment backing up. Uh, it provides signs within the work zone to give guidance and designs buffer spaces to protect pedestrians from vehicles and work zone equipment. There's a lot of other ones in there. This is a typical example of an internal traffic control plan, kind of a, a pre-printed template that the foreman can take and then write in every day like where the access and egress of trucks is, where the people should be and should not be. I know that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But the expectation is that this is done every day. Now, it can be something really fancy like this, or it can be just a diagram from the foreman. And then a safety meeting centered around that. That involves not just the employees of the company, but also DOT people that are out there, trucks hauling in and out of there. All this needs to be communicated to the people regarding the internal traffic control plan. And it involves a lot of the things that I just previously mentioned. This is kind of a fancy one, but again, it can be done just as a drawing on a piece of paper with a foreman. This is fairly new. Flagging, we all understand that different states require different types of certification when it comes to flagging. Uh, you may have heard of ATSA, American Traffic Safety Surfaces, Services, that does a lot of the certification across the United States. A lot of states have their own certification, but flaggers do need to be trained and certified. It deals with not just signaling, and, but also positioning. And positioning is important. Sometimes our flaggers, they get complacent. They get out of position. They put themselves in harm's way, and they don't even know it. So position them in the right way. And then sometimes we'll go beyond that and even set up something prior to the flagger station to protect that flagger. And that's a little bit beyond the regulations, but that's the best practice. Cones and warning signs in, well in advance of the flagger station. But again, where that flagger positions himself is very important and that he stay in that position and out of harm's way. Of course, wearing high visibility, clothing, workers, class two, flaggers, class three, nighttime, daytime, all that is in this information, and I understand that you'll get a copy of this presentation uh, to be able to go back through this. But high vis, I think we all understand the different requirements for between class two and class three. Lots of times, uh, some of the best practice that we'll do is, even though class two is just required, we'll add the anklets and, and some reflectivity around the wrist to kind of outline that body at night, even using the class two, and then also for flaggers especially, the requirement is full class three clothing. A lot of our entire crews wear that at night. I don't know about you guys, we have a lot, a lot of night work. Probably 60% of our work across the United States is night work. I told you we had about 20,000 employees, about a third of those, six to 7,000 employees work out on the roadways. So we have a lot of exposure out there, a lot of risk going on. Backup alarms, and there, as you know, there's a lot of different kind of backup alarms. You got your regular air uh, uh, backing backup alarm that we all are aware of, but also in certain areas we're allowed to use white noise or broadband backup alarms, and then sometimes the air horn is used as well. Marking overhead power lines is a big deal, as you well know. Sometimes we have signage there. Sometimes we have a lot of power lines, right? all in one close spot, so it takes a lot of signs or cones to mark those out there. But uh, inevitably, when you have a lot of power lines, you know the risk, not just from the bed, red, raised beds of the trucks, but also if you're sitting on the paver or the milling machine or the or a shuttle buggy, you're still going to run into that. We had a guy one year uh, going under power lines in Birmingham, Alabama. He was on a, a shuttle buggy. And the power lines were really low and close, so he decided to take the umbrella out of the chair that he was sitting in. And now you know the rest of the story, right? And guess what? It, he's, he's still with us today, but when he raised it up, it lit him up, right? It blew him off that shuttle buggy. But he was, he was very fortunate. So things like that we don't think about when we get out there. It was mentioned earlier, you know, that we get kind of complacent. And we got traffic right beside us at 70 and 80 miles an hour, so we really need to do things to keep our awareness level up. Of course, seat belts, it's a requirement. It's amazing if you go out on a crew and look at how many people are not wearing their seat belt. And it's not if when it comes to seat belt uses, it's when. And we've, I've, I've had to investigate a lot of uh, roller rollovers 
from people not wearing their seat belts. They, they're on that flat ground, back and forth all day long. They don't think they ever need that seat belt. And that's when they roll off the shoulder just a little bit. And you well know those things are top heavy. They don't take much. And uh, first thing you want to do is when that thing starts tipping over is to jump. Got your seat, don't have your seat belt on. When you jump and hit the ground, guess what's right behind you? The roller. Sure is. It's coming after you. So the seat belt, there's room to live in that area. So those are just a few examples of what's required, what's compliance in our work zone. Not all inclusive by any means. I want to make sure you're clear on that. But some high points of what we really need to think about. This is where it all begins, though, is how do we look at risk? And there's three components to risk that we may want to make sure that we're aware of. And there's a whole formula to this, and we're not going to get into that today. This is kind of an overview. But frequency, likelihood, and severity really calculate the risk. There may be a lot of opportunity to reduce the risk out there. And by looking at the frequency, you know, what's the exposure, likelihood, or the chance of it happening, and last but not least, what, how bad could it be? The severity of it really gives us a, a good picture of what risk is all about, whether it be work zone intrusions, whether it be an internal traffic control plan with trucks backing up. You know, a lot of our areas, especially with milling operations, get very congested, and there's not room for folks out there. And we've, we've really got to separate that area where equipment and pedestrians are or are not. I know that, you know, 30 years ago when I almost 40 years ago now, when I first started. We didn't even think about that, you know? And as a result, we had a lot of injuries and a lot of fatalities. So what's acceptable and what's not? Let me ask you a question. Can we eliminate all risk out there on the road? Can't. It's impossible. There's a certain amount of risk out there that's uncontrollable. Just like it was mentioned earlier, that person texting coming through the job site, person drinking coming through the job site, or that roller operator who uh, may not be wearing his seatbelt. Or the hired hauler coming back to the paver and a new employee walks between the paver and the truck backing up. Things like that, we can minimize, we can mitigate, we can reduce it. But some of it we cannot control. And we have to realize that and take extra defenses out there to really provide a safe work environment for our folks. So when you do a risk assessment, you know, you got to identify the risk first and reduce it. But here's some of the things that go into a risk assessment. I'll just kind of like let you look at that, read those, maybe take those in. What processes are we doing? What training do we have out there? Where do we put the new employee most of the time? What do we give the new employee first few days on the job? A shovel or a flag, right? So that's what we're thinking about. We, if we give them a shovel, that's one thing. But if we give them a flag... That's a whole nother story. Have we trained him? Have we really provided the time to help him understand what's going on out there? Because his responsibility is the rest of, you know, deals with the rest of our lives out there. So talking about all the different hazards and risks, congestion, speed, you know, you may be in a residential area, a lot of hazards and risks to be taken and to discuss during this risk assessment meeting. What equipment should we be wearing? proper PPE, on and on and on. Do we have the right traffic control out there? How the truck's getting in and out of there? Are we using spotters? Not just for intrusions. You know, sometimes we're right next to traffic. In fact, we may be out into that traffic lane doing some shovel work or something like that. Do we have somebody spotting for that person? Do we have a spotter backing that truck up to the paver? Those are tough questions to answer, but really, that's how you mitigate that's how you reduce that risk out there. So what's management responsibilities? Are they providing the right training for the managers? Does everybody get work zone awareness training? We give work zone awareness training to all of our employees every spring and then the new employees when they come on board. Are we meeting with the local law enforcement folks and getting their help out there to provide addition, additional visibility and enforcement? Meeting with state associations and DOTs regarding maybe you know, we do need to lower the speed limit out there. Maybe we do need some additional signage out there. And this is a partnering effort. This is a group effort that we all need to agree to. And then communicating with all the contractors. Sometimes we think, well, the striper guy, striping guy, he's out there at night. I ain't got to worry about him. No, he's part of us. All the contractors, this whole, everyone on this project is a team. 
And we owe it to all of them to communicate them and be out there when they're out there. So, assessing the risk starts first thing in the morning. You guys, this is very common. Huddle up, talk about what we're going to do this day, talk about the risk, talk about the equipment, talk about the PPE, and talk about how we can minimize the risk and hazards out there. That's when to do it. It's the start of the day. But let me ask you something. Is that where it stops? Do we just do it that first time early in the morning? When should we do it again? All day. But well, let me ask you, why would we do it all day? Do things always go according to plan out there? <laughs> Yeah, that's part of my joke. Everybody should be laughing about that. We don't. I mean, we have a plan. We got a plan A. We got a plan B. (laughs) Yeah, well, we hope we all go home at the end of the day as plan B, hopefully. Hopefully that's plan A, actually. But what we want to prepare for is those things we don't think about. So having these type meetings throughout the day is important because things do change, right? The plan changes all day long. And if we don't stop and reassess the risk, and we're setting ourselves up for that bad incident. So let me ask you a question. This is the only test question I'm going to ask. But if we abide by every law, every rule, every regulation, comply with all of them, whether it be OSHA, whether it be the DOT, whether it be whatever it might be, safety, laws, all does that guarantee that no one gets hurt? That's a problem, isn't it? Compliance does not guarantee everybody goes home at the end of the day. Compliance is just the foundation. That's just where we start. It's what we do beyond compliance. The best practices, assessing the reducing the risk that really is the life-saving action on our part to make sure everybody goes back to their family. So just saying, look, I'm compliance with the rules and law. I'm complying with the manual and uniform track. That's just where we start. Don't use that as an excuse to say everything's okay out here because you just answered the question. That's not enough. So what do we do beyond compliance? I'm glad we all agreed with that because there's things that all of us in this room can do to really provide additional protection beyond the rules and regulations. And that's some of the things I want to talk about right now. But it started a long time ago. This, this thing about best practices and doing, going beyond compliance is not anything new. I'd love to, to be able to be the one to coin that term, beyond compliance, but it, it came in a long time before me. It started even back during the days of the Empire State Building. You know, when they built the Empire State Building, they estimated a fatality every other floor. Can you imagine that? And they said, build the cost of those fatalities into your bid. Now, what, what if you're like on floor number nine and you're sitting on that, I beam next to your buddy and you're looking at him and there hadn't been a fatality in about the last three or four floors and you're going well it ain't going to be me it might be you but you know it's a nervous feeling out there right same thing with the Golden Gate Bridge when they built the Golden Gate Bridge they told the contractors to put into their bid the cost of 33 fatalities 33 fatalities so the contractor that got the award that was awarded the bid he, he couldn't accept that he said, I can't accept the fact that I'm going to lose 33 of my employees on this job. And he did something that no other contractor had ever done before. And they called him crazy. They called him stupid. They called him, you know, he was way out of his league when he was putting this into place. Anybody know what that was? Close. He built the first safety net. First safety, the beginning of fall protection. He built the first safety net. Folks laughed at him. Contractors laughed at him. Owners laughed at him. Employees even said, well, he's a little crazy. At the end of the job, 27 people went into that net and lived. And that was the beginning. And that's where we have to think, outside the box. That's where protection, life-saving activity is, is when we're thinking outside the box. People may think, well, that's crazy. That's, That's stupid. Well, guess what? That's what they said about him. And that was the beginning of fall protection for us. So, thinking outside the box. Preventing backovers, that's huge. I think it says each month at least one worker is killed by a backover. That's that's staggering. That's really scary. So, backovers, that pedestrian vehicle segregation in your work zone is highly important. to Because that on our side of the cones, not counting work zone intrusions, backovers is also a leading cause of fatalities. Using spotters. As we mentioned earlier, to get the equipment, 
back to the paver or spotting the equipment to dump, whatever it may be. Huge. Making sure they, the signals and the communication is understood by everyone, that the spotter and the operator understand the signals properly. A lot of hired truckers may not. You know, it may be different. Communication is a huge, huge piece of uh, work zone safety and protection out there. Using those spotters, making sure they're designated, and making sure that that's their only job. They're not also doing shoveling. They're not also running the pay. They're not also doing these other things. They're spotting, and that's their only job. And when somebody comes into that no man's land between the paver and the backing truck, everything stops, right? And that spotter's responsible to do that. Some of our pavers, we put even lights on them for red and green. You may have seen some of these, you know, letting the truck know when he can back up or when he cannot back up, using those red and green lights with the paver operator. Walking around the equipment, that can never be understated. Gold, get out and look, right? So walking around your equipment, and these are actual incidents, those blind spots. We had, we had a subcontractor doing some patchwork, skid steer operator ran over his grade checker. And they were working right there together in a, in a, in a space about half the size of this room. And you think, how can they miss each other like that? Up in Michigan, ran over and killed him. A lot of blind spots around the vehicles. I'll show you a, a, a diagram here in just a second of where a lot of the blind spots are. You already know a lot of this, but fatalities involve a worker being struck by a vehicle account for 73% of the transportation-related work zone incidents, with half occurring with a construction vehicle backing up. So, you know, that's fixable. That's doable. But there's the demonstration, and we know this right in front. We, lots of times we don't think about that. Right in front of that vehicle, that, that guy can't see you. Right behind him and then also on that, to the right on that passenger side. Now NIOSH has a lot of diagrams, uh, equipment specific, that can show you specific blind spots around those equipments. And I would encourage you to look that up. You can go online and get that. You can go to uh, Work Zone Clearinghouse and get that, NAPA. So we talked about backup alarms uh, to help prevent backovers, but also cameras and radar and sonar, not just with trucks, but also loaders and you know, all kind of different equipment out there. A lot of different uh, mixer trucks. We got, man, we got over 5,000 or 3,000 mixers across the United States, and those are a big, big risk out there on job sites with, with uh, blind spots. We got a lot of cameras and radar on those. We have a 10-foot rule that we use, and this is one of those best practices beyond compliance, that if a person on foot comes within 10 feet of a piece of operating equipment, they must establish some type of communication, whether it be by eye contact, verbally, but if communication is not established within that 10 foot, the equipment shuts down until that communication is achieved. Simple, very effective, you just have to follow it. 10 foot rule. And on paving jobs, that's challenging. Even if you're bumping that joint and looking up at that roller operator, you've established that communication, but you need to do that. So that's the 10 foot rule. I just explained it. Uh, other things about equipment uh, 30 foot away from a travel lane, parking it off 30 foot away if, po if at all possible. Uh, driving the job site at the end of the day to see where the equipment is, to make sure it is away from traffic as much as possible, if there's better areas to, to park it. And then also make sure it's, it's illuminated with reflective tape, things like that. 40% of our injuries are getting on and off equipment. Slips, trips, and falls. You would think we could fix that. <laughs> but there's all kinds of different sized people that get on and off the equipment, right? Some are younger than others, some are bigger than others, but this three points of contact that we utilize really helps us at all times, whether it be on the plants, whether it be on the equipment coming in and out of trucks, three points of your parts points of your body need to be touching that stairs or steps or ladders, whatever it may be, when going up and down. Three points of contact. I talked earlier about pulling down power lines. You know, whether it be the guy on the shuttle buggy with the umbrella or the bed coming through there, we got a lot of folks. What I don't understand is how can a, a truck driver not pull down one set of traffic signals, 
put two sets of traffic signals in the same trip. You'd think after that first set, he'd get the idea, but I've seen him pull down two sets of traffic signals coming out of a job site. So a lot of our, well, hopefully 100% of our trucks all have some type of warning device in the cab to let the driver know that bed is still up, whether it be a light or an audible alarm at some point. Uh, getting messages to the public. Let's talk about that real briefly. Using the message board, of course. You can use that radio and TV spots, letting folks know that, hey, we're going to be out here at, from 10 to 6 tonight. And maybe we want to take an alternate route uh, using the DOT public information system and then the mobile devices for traffic and construction work updates, telling them when we're going to be out there. Also, communication with the emergency services, right? Making sure they know we're out there, how they should get in and out if there is an incident, and the flaggers having some training there on help getting the emergency vehicles in and out of the job site. If you've been on a job site before with a lot of traffic, that becomes very challenging, especially if you're the guy flagging traffic out there, right? But communication with those up front before the incident occurs. Now, we talked about work zone safety on our side of the cones, but what about keeping the public out of our yard, out of our work zones? Work zone intrusions are also another leading cause of work zone fatalities. A lot of these things you've known before, you know, minimize your time working closely to the traffic. I mean, if you're just walking the job site, don't walk next to the traffic. Try to get as far away as you can. If you're got traffic on both sides of you, then try to walk on the side facing the traffic. Just little things like that really make a big difference. And I'm going to go through this rather quickly because I want to get to the technology piece. But this is all about walking the job site out in the grass, away from the traffic, facing the traffic if you have to be close. Utilize a spotter if you need to, if you're working directly next to traffic. If you're having a meeting, please don't have it right there where the traffic is. If the Equipment is stopped, waiting on mix or whatever uh, the, the incident may be for the equipment to be stopped. Park it at an angle to where if the incoming traffic were to intrude, it would push the traffic away from where we are working. Parking those rollers and other equipment at an angle to deflect the traffic away. Mid-lane devices, you've seen a lot of these. Letting the person that intruded know that they're in the work zone. Lighting in the work zone for equipment. And, you know, we can get too much lighting out there. We can get, we don't want to cause confusion. So once you get illumination out there, whether it be on the equipment and on the people, ride the job site. Make sure it makes sense to you. Or have your family go through there and see if it makes sense to them. Because if it makes sense to them, we're doing pretty good. But if it's confusing them, we're pretty much confusing the rest of the public as well. So maybe using them to help uh, assess the work site when it comes to lighting. Lighting up not just the equipment, but also uh, lighting up those lone workers like the QC guy or where the guy's tacking. Uh, make sure those are lit at night as well. Uh, personal lighting. Well, there's a tack truck lit up. But personnel lighting. Before I get into personnel lighting, I want to make one point. Let's make sure we got that conspicuity tape on all the equipment, the reflectivity tape. It really lights up when the headlights hit it. Lots of times we forget about that. And that doesn't necessarily come from the manufacturer. Personal illumination. And I'm not pushing these kind of lights, but they work really well for us. They call the halo lights. They work really, some of you nodding your head, light up very well and really, you know, the traffic really recognizes that. Even the paddles can be illuminated. Stop and slow paddles. Hand tools, even putting this, the reflectivity tape on the hand tools so they light up at night. When folks come by there, use it, you know, closing the area when you can. That, this is not always acceptable, but, you know, if, we, if it's an area that we can temporarily close using a uh, certain type of uh, jersey barriers, or they got a lot more advanced barriers out there now to do that. Automated flagging devices. I can tell you stories about automated flagging devices that got struck by cars and, and a million pieces out there in the road. And, but uh, better that gets struck than the, than the guy that was out there. We get, we get flaggers hit every year. We get flaggers hit. Rumble strips, 
especially prior to the flagger. And then more complex systems like vehicle arrest systems. If you're getting a lot of intrusions, it's worth the investment in some of these vehicle arrest systems. Little things like this, like on the turnouts where cars are making U-turns, making sure they don't get in that closed lane. Pull, yeah, Th this helps out a lot. Just little things like that will help out a lot. It will keep them out of that closed lane. Additional truck mount attenuators when you've got multi-lane uh, closures that you got going on. Again, message boards, good traffic control trucks to pick up and, and deploy barrels and cones. Last but not least, enforcement. This slows people down. Those lights slow people down. And then if you, can, if you can get the enforcement out there and if you can get him to pursue, it makes a lot of, and that's a challenge, I know. But getting them out there is the first. And sometimes we pay for that on our own. Sometimes that's not in the bid, but we'll pay for it on our own because it's just worth it having it out there. Additional signage, which sometimes does need DOT approval, also is an emotional appeal. And then let's talk real quickly about intrusion alarms, because I'm running kind of short on my time here. But advanced warning systems, any kind of intrusion alarms, whether it be the sonar blaster with the cone, whether it be the air hose uh, with the dolly that you see that stretched across the lane, or just the air horn that can be put on the rollers, for the because that roller operator is usually the, the first line of defense, or the flagger with the handheld uh, air horn, like, or even the whistle. that We use the whistles a lot in Texas. So technology can help. We have to look towards technology and it's ever-changing to really help us prevent work zone intrusion. And these are all the things I just mentioned on those pictures. It's just reiterating here in text. Again, the air hose stretch across. The, the, the issue with those is where do you put them, <laughs> right? Where do you put that, that horn on the cone that would alarm if somebody hits the cone because you've you got a thousand cones out there. Where do you put that air hose across there? You got, you know, where do you put that additional truck mount attenuator? Those are the challenges you have when you have those lone devices. So I want to talk real briefly about some advanced technology that we're working on within Old Castle, have been for uh, going on four years now, uh, using technology to prevent work zone intrusions and to give our em employees and the people working with us out there a little extra time when somebody intrudes into our work zone. I'm going to show you a short video that um, will show us that. day, our crews put themselves at risk. Distracted, impaired, and even reckless drivers are commonplace on our roads. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration states that 80% of accidents and 16% of highway deaths are the result of distracted drivers. This is one accident every 24 seconds, many in construction zones. Despite the many precautions we take as an industry, vehicle intrusions are the leading cause of worker fatalities within the road construction industry. We need new safety measures, systems that are always on, always vigilant, and never fatigue. A system that will provide them with crucial seconds that could save their life. At Old Castle, we view safety as our family business, and we are constantly looking to forge a better way. For this reason, Old Castle has developed the AWARE system. AWARE, advanced warning and risk evasion.
Developed from technology designed to save soldiers' lives, AWARE uses state-of-the-art radar coupled with cutting-edge position and orientation sensors. Advanced software continually monitors and learns the active work zone while vigilantly tracking the surrounding live traffic. Once a threat is identified, the system generates audible and visual alerts, urging the offending driver to alter their behavior. Simultaneously, the system issues individual alerts directly to each worker in harm's way and begins recording video of the incident with its onboard high-definition camera that can be used in accident investigations as required. The AWARE system has four main components, a high-tech sensor called the Raven, a GPS-based worker alert unit called Work Tracks, a visible and audible threat deterrent unit for the traveling public, and a base station application that runs on an iPad or tablet. At the heart of the Raven sensor is the advanced radar that provides coverage out to 600 feet. The Raven not only detects speed, but position and trajectory of up to 64 vehicles simultaneously. Additionally, the radar coverage from multiple Raven sensors overlap to create a fully protected work zone. The Raven sensor constantly scans the protected area and surrounding live traffic to identify threats. The Raven smart technology with self-learning software knows the difference between a true threat and vehicles passing safely. Construction traffic moving safely within the work zone is rejected as a threat, greatly reducing the number of false alarms and preventing desensitization of the workers to the alarms. Situational awareness is provided by the work tracks units, which are worn on each worker's hard hat, chest, or arm. The GPS-based work tracks unit is small, lightweight, and knows the worker's position so that it only alerts when a real threat is approaching. The threat deterrents are a key component of the aware system. When activated by the Raven sensor, the public can be warned both audibly, with a variety of possible sounds, as well as visually from a range of LED light colors and strobe patterns. The threat deterrent is activated when either a passing vehicle exceeds the maximum travel lane speed or when a work zone intrusion has occurred. Currently, the AWARE system has been developed and tested for three construction applications. Mobile operations such as striping or traffic control setup. Construction on multi-lane highways and two-lane, two-way applications when using a flagger for control. Additionally, without any changes, the system will also provide critical protection for loan worker scenarios, such as sign placement, road maintenance, and emergency repairs. Let's take a closer look at how the system works in these applications. Using its lane detection technology, the Raven learns where the mobile operations, such as a truck-mounted attenuator, has been. It then determines if an approaching vehicle is on a collision course, even around curves. Drivers speeding and swerving at the last minute are a real threat in mobile applications and often lead to a rear-end collision. The threat deterrence in the AWARE system will alert any offending driver with plenty of time to safely merge out of the lane. Using multiple Raven sensors and a work tracks device on each crew member, the AWARE system can cover an entire paving crew working within a lane drop. Vehicles that pass safely by the work zone do not set off the alerts. However, if a vehicle suddenly intrudes into the lane drop, the system is immediately triggered. The AWARE system is also configurable to operate as a watchdog for the flagger. The Raven sensor learns normal traffic patterns automatically and adjust to accommodate the environment. It not only protects the flagger, but also the vehicles in the queue. When traffic is stopped, the Raven uses the last vehicle in the queue to measure the distance at which approaching vehicles should stop, helping to prevent rear-end collisions. When traffic is flowing, any vehicles that are approaching in an unsafe manner, such as passing other vehicles in the queue, immediately activate the work tracks and threat deterrent system giving the flagger and driver the critical seconds needed to avoid a devastating collision. Field users can set up and control basic functions of the system from a user-friendly iPad application. Settings such as safe speed limit, lane width, work zone type, and support features are available on the app. 
A site supervisor can also monitor the position of each worker and piece of equipment in real time while getting a status update from the built-in test routines on each device. The work track system is also easy to initiate each day with automatic user identification. An RFID tag in each worker's hard hat allows the work tracks to sync information automatically. Once synced, the work tracks icon pops up on the map showing the location and status. Manual assignment is also possible, which allows subcontractors and guests on the job site equal protection. Now let's see how AWARE works in just one of these situations. Because of AWARE, tragedy was avoided. The AWARE system does reduce the risk of working alongside active traffic. However, there are limitations. Distance, speed, and reaction time all play a role. For example, a vehicle entering a work zone at 65 miles per hour can be detected by the Raven up to 600 feet away, providing more than six seconds for action to be taken. During that time, the average person could run five lane widths more than enough to avoid the oncoming vehicle. However, if the same vehicle entered just 100 feet from impact, there would be less than one second to react, all but eliminating the likelihood of escaping without injury. For this reason, the AWARE system should not replace existing best practices for work zone intrusion prevention, but rather complement them. When a work zone intrusion occurs, our workers have precious seconds to react. The AWARE system has the potential to prevent the intrusion from happening altogether and give our crews the seconds they need to survive, creating a safer environment for everyone on the road. AWARE, advanced warning and risk evasion. Smart technology for a safer workplace. All right, important point there is Technology needs to be used in conjunction with best practices. They work together, not alone, because best practices alone won't provide you the full protection or technology alone, both of them working together. So think about that. And the main thing here is, is thinking outside the box. When we first started this three years ago and the guy showed me how this was a uh, defense contractor using that uh, system they call the Iron Curtain where the RPG is fired upon that Humvee and it provides that curtain of protection. I couldn't really relate to how that would provide protection for our workers. Maybe a drunk driver coming into our work zone could be, uh, we, we could do the same thing to the drunk driver that they were doing to the missile. I'm just kidding, but that we had to make that stretch. We had to think outside the box, right? So that's what I encourage you to do is think outside the box. And there's a lot of specialized training also for our people out there, as you can see here, for flaggers, operators, working at night. This is some of the best training there is out there for work zone that covers all aspects of work zones, day, night, individual type training. And that's available through uh, Asphalt Pavement Association. And then, of course, every April we have National Work Zone Awareness Week. But there's a reason we do all this and reducing the risk, assessing the risk, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. You know, risk is out there, and lots of times we don't see it, right? But it's there. And we gotta do everything we can to reduce and mitigate that risk, because the reason we do that is for this reason right here, right? Is to go home to those who care about us and waiting on us. And we also owe that obligation to those we work side by side with. 